Hello and welcome to Archie Corner. In this episode, we will discuss the code requirements for roof venting. So let's get started. The requirements for providing roof ventilation can be found in the International Residential Code, Section 806.2, and the International Building Code, Section 1202.2. Although the wording and formatting is not exactly the same, the requirements are practically identical. Before explaining the requirements, let's discuss the objective of venting to clarify this video. For attics to be vented, there has to be cross ventilation. Let's look at this section to get started. If you were to only have vents on this side of the roof, venting would not be appropriate as air would come in and come out from the same side, meaning that the opposite side would just have air that is not moving, it stays stale. However, if we added venting on the other side, it would create the cross ventilation that we are looking for. Another thing to have in mind is that there are different types of vents and they are installed in different roof locations. For example, we have under eave vents which normally go in this location. We have wind turbines which usually go on the roof itself. We also have other types of attic ventilators that go on the roof. The reality is that we can spend all day talking about different types of ventilators, but let's skip that part for now and focus on the concept. The point is to provide vents in such a way that there is cross ventilation. We will look at this later in more detail. For now, let's divide the portion of the roof into the upper portion and the lower portion. While it may be okay to have all or most of the ventilation on the lower portion, you do not want to have ventilation only on your upper portion of the roof. Again, the reason is that you want to have cross ventilation. If you only have venting on the upper portion, you will not achieve cross ventilation throughout the entire roof. The venting would be limited to the upper portion and the bottom portion would remain stale. Now that we understand that concept, let's talk code sections related to vented roofs, which basically provide two venting options. Before we discuss those options, if you would like to support the efforts that go into producing my videos, you can do so in various ways. You can buy me a coffee. You can be my Patreon. Information to all my accounts is noted in the video description. Whether you buy me a coffee or become my Patreon or not, you can always simply like and subscribe to my channel. And please, hit that like button. It costs nothing. Lastly, if you know others that may benefit from this channel, please share it with them. And now, back to our video. As I was saying, there are basically two options. First option is having most, if not all of your venting, on the lower portion of the roof. The second option is to only have between 40 to 50% of the venting on the upper portion. Let's see how that breaks down. In the first option, the first requirement is that the minimum net free venting area shall be 1 1 50th of the area of the vented space. And depending on whether you are referencing the IBC or IRC, here are the code sections. Let's start by figuring out the area of the roof that needs to be vented. If we look at the roof in a plan view, you will notice that most roofs have an overhang, but the actual attic space that needs to be vented is usually limited to the building outline as shown here. This might make a bit more sense if we look at a section view again. When we look at a section view, we notice that the building may have overhangs, but the actual vented area is limited to the attic space outlined here. So don't get confused by looking at this section. The reference code requirements are not based on the volume of the attic space. Nope, they are based on the area, which we can get from the floor plan view. For this exercise, let's assume the area of the roof attic is 1000 square feet. The rest of the math is straightforward. We simply divide the area of 1000 square feet by 150. This provides us with the required ventilation in square feet. In this case, 6.667 square feet. However, all product information for roof vents usually provide the net free area in square inches. So let's convert this into square inches by multiplying it by 144. This provides us with 960 square inches as the minimum required venting area. 
Now that we know how much net free area of venting we need, the rest depends on the type of vents we select and the manufacturer that provides them. There are many types and manufacturers out there, but for sample purposes, let's assume we are using under eave vents. Let's look at a typical eave section to explain this. As discussed previously, these are the vents that allow air to come into the attic in this direction, and they look like this. When looking at the manufacturer's product information, it is important to note that we are looking for the net free area of the vent, not the vent size. For example, a vent might be 22 inches by 3 inches in physical size, but that does not mean that the provided net free area is 22 inches by 3 inches. The net free area provided by the vent can only be known by looking at the manufacturer's literature. For this example, let's assume the manufacturer's literature states that the net free area is 34 square inches. Assuming we are only using eave vents, we divide 960 by 34, which equals 28.24. We round this up to 29 required vents minimum. Now, we have to show the location of the vents on the roof plan. And as we do this, you will notice that if we were to only use eave vents, we would have to use a lot of eave vents. For this and other reasons, that is why other types of vents are also used in conjunction with these vents. For example, we already discussed vents that go on the roof itself, such as roof-mounted attic ventilators and wind turbine vents. There are various other vents that I won't get into, such as low-profile roof-mounted vents, soffit vents, gable vents, etc. Regardless of which type of vent you choose, the idea is the same. For the purposes of this example, let's assume we will use wind turbines. But before doing calculations for this, I want to talk about the second option we spoke of earlier. There is an exception on the IBC and IRC that state that if 40% to 50% of the venting is located in the upper portion of the attic and if you are in climate zone 6, 7, or 8, you provide a class 1 or 2 vapor retarder on the warm and winter side of the ceiling, you can reduce the venting area requirement to only 1 300th of the area of the vented space. That is half of the venting requirement compared to option 1. Since we are going to use wind turbines anyway, let's take advantage of this. Let's assume that the vapor retarder is being placed as per the exception. Let's also assume that we will install the turbines on the top portion of the roof as shown on the section. Now, the area of venting that is required would have to change because we just cut it in half from 1 1 50th to 1 300th of the area. So let's recalculate. 1,000 square feet divided by 300 equals 3.33 square feet. And like before, we convert that to square inches by multiplying 3.33 by 144, which equals 479.52 square inches. That is the minimum venting area that we need. Since we are now using wind turbines, the net free area will be different. Every manufacturer is different and they have different sizes and models. For this example, we will assume that the wind turbine provides 95 square inches of net free area. Since we are aiming to get 40% to 50% of the venting via wind turbines, let's multiply the minimum required of 479.52 by 0 0.4 to get the minimum area we need from turbines, which is a 40%. This equals 191.8 net free area minimum. Now, if we divide 191.8 by the NFA provided by one wind turbine, which we discussed is 95 NFA, we get 2.02. .02. Man, that is really, really close. But unfortunately, this will require that we use three wind turbines. Continuing with the calculations, 95 square inches times three turbines provided gives us a total of 285 square inches of net free area venting provided by the turbines. Now, remember, we need to get a minimum of 50% of airflow from the lower portion of the roof. Therefore, we must provide at least 285 square inches or more with eave vents or other type of vents in the lower portion of the roof. 
Assuming we continue using under eave vents for the lower portion of the roof, the math would be 285 divided by 34, which equals 8.38, which would require 9 vents. Let's now check to see what we get. 34 square inches times 9 vents equals 306 square inches of venting provided by our under eave vents. The total venting we are providing is 591 square inches. This meets the minimum requirements. Doing the math, we also confirm that 48.2% of venting is provided on the upper portion of the roof with wind turbines and 51.8% in the lower portion of the roof with eave vents. We now meet and exceed the minimum requirements for roof venting and we are also keeping the proportion correct. That is to say, keeping the upper venting between 40 and 50%. The only thing that is left now is to show these on the roof plan. So let's do it. Let's remember to spread them out to allow for cross ventilation. You don't want to have the vents all on the same wall. Three wind turbines on the top and nine under eave vents around the building. I am not going to get too much into this, but shear walls usually have to reach up to the roof. So be careful not to place eave vents above a shear wall unless your structural engineer is okay with that. And well, that is it guys. Those are the basic code requirements for venting roofs. By the way, if you don't know what shear walls are, check out episode 40. Let's face it, if you stuck to the end of this video, that means you liked the video or at least appreciated the content. So please hit that like button. And if you would like to support me, information to my Buy Me A Coffee page and Patreon accounts are in the video description. I hope you liked the video. I will see you next time. But for now, this is Archie Corner signing out.